Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of our show. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle. Today we have with us Joshua Latimer with AutomateGrowSell.com. Welcome to the show, Joshua. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm very excited to talk to you. Yeah, you know, um, the, what I'd like to jump right into is tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to the business you're in now, and most importantly or interestingly enough, where you are now. Well, as of this phone call, I am calling you from Costa Rica, and you know, I have a hammock outside of my office, and there's monkeys <laughs> in my backyard, and all of those warm and fuzzy things, but uh, it certainly didn't start out that way by any stretch of the imagination. I was born in Flint, Michigan, which nobody really knew about until recently because of the water crisis and all the mess oh, that's yeah. going on up there, but super, um, super rough place, you know, very tough economically, and just a lot of, a lot of issues up there, and just raised by blue collar family. I mean, the big three automakers are there. People have a worker's mentality primarily. I was really the first entrepreneur in my family. And in my early 20s, I had a, a knack for, for sales and, I, and an interest in finance. So I did some mortgages with a large national mortgage provider for, for a couple years. And then I moved and transitioned as a uh, personal banker for JP Morgan and did that. But, you know, when I was 25 years old, my wife was pregnant with our first son. And I had like this panic attack where I could visualize myself rotting away in my cubicle with my little tie choking the life out of me. And I honestly, I really just started freaking out about it. So I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't have all the answers, but I started a cleaning business. And the reason I chose window cleaning was because it's very high margins. It's a niche business and it's a repeat service. And so I went after that. You know, my mom wouldn't talk to me for a week when I did that, of course, because she was so terrified that I was going to ruin my <laughs> life. Um, but, you know, that, that was the beginning. For me. That was kind of my, my pivotal burn the bridge moment. I built that business um, pretty large, ended up servicing some massive accounts and doing work for General Motors and all kinds of large corporations. And it just got really, really good. And, you know, my passion was always automating and systemizing the business and really investing in my team and trying to build really quality relationships around me. And that's why that business did so well. So I sold that company to a California-based cleaning uh, company uh, this last year, and we packed up our stuff and moved down to sunny Costa Rica. So that's kind of where we're at now. And I run a, a couple of online businesses. You know, I have a software company and then my uh, small business uh, boot camp that I promote. So that's where I'm at. Neat. You know, and, and the thing that I hear when you describe that is flexibility and family, because why would you do all of that? You could have, you know, probably franchised that business and sold that and worked 23 and a half hours a day. So speak to what drove you to uh, uh, set those things in place for, you know, the automation strategies, the systems, so that you could get that flexibility and focus more on your family. Because with a young family with four kids, you, you know, that's really important. You, you want to watch them grow up and be there. Absolutely. And, you know, all of these things start with a why. And, you know, every self-help book on the planet in regards to business is like, you know, begin with the end in mind, you know, Stephen Covey or, you know, what is your why? Why are we doing this? And I had a really clear vision of what I was trying to do really early in my business. And even when we had nothing and I was out there driving around working 100 hours a week, making very little money, I could see, you know, I can visualize what I was trying to do. And, and that's really important in any business because every decision you make every day, every system you put in place is either going to move you closer to your why or further away from your why. So I think for me, the reason it took off is because I had a very specific destination and the destination always was freedom of time. Now, it's funny. One of my favorite quotes is an entrepreneur is someone who trades in a 40 hour work week so they can work a hundred hours a week, right? <laughs> so but when you're working on something that you love and you're building a machine that's an asset for your family, it just feels different. And there's yeah. something about it that is fascinating to me. And it's not about the money. It's about the machine. It's about putting a little box together with moving parts. And you can drop a dollar in the top and two dollars come out the bottom. That entire process is super awesome, super interesting. And yes, it does get me to my why, which is to have elasticity in my schedule 
to have location freedom, to be able to work really hard from, you know, Central America and go to the beach, you know, on a Tuesday. And that stuff's all real. Um, but there's a long road in between today and, and when I started. And the reason it worked is because I was very obsessed with my end goal. Yeah, and you know, um, I would say with we could probably spend about two and a half weeks on closing that gap, um, you know, what, what you did, but I would suspect that you, number one, got that um, end in mind, and they started working backwards with a certain plan, and then I will bet you had some one or two or three mentors or accountability group members. Can you speak to um, how, what that looked like and how that helped you drive to that end? Oh, absolutely. I mean, accountability is everything. And when you're a young guy or you're, you know, I played football in high school and you think you know everything and you think you're so awesome. And then you look back and you're like so embarrassed that you even acted the way you did. But that mentality when you're young is to escape accountability. You know, you don't want it. You don't want to be accountable to anybody or anything. And there's like this rebellious heart in a lot of people. But what's funny is as I mature and I grow as a business person and as a dad and You know, now today I crave accountability. Accountability is the backbone uh, that brings the stability you need to succeed really at anything. So in the early parts of my business, I tried to do everything myself. And my first big light bulb was understanding the power of a team. And I've been super blessed to be mentored and coached by very, very successful people. I mean, some of these people, it's just a miracle that I even know who they are. And they, you know, just little nuggets, little nuggets here, little nuggets there, networking with like-minded people, holding yourself accountable before friends and colleagues to, to, to do what you say you're going to do. It really drives you. So I, I'm a huge fan of accountability. And to this day, I have a weekly mastermind group with a great friend of mine in Iowa who runs another software company and, you know, um, iron sharpens iron. So I'm yeah. all in on accountability. Yeah, and and um, I I would suspect, I, and I'm pretty confident that I've read this. Tony Robbins has a mentor, has a coach. In fact, some of these t- um, high performance <clears throat> coaches have two and three. Um, and and I know I, I heard a podcast recently from uh, Hal Elrod, um, who said he's got like four business uh, coaches, you know, business and personal and wealth and all these things. And I don't I don't think we can ever go. I'm, I've attained, or I got this, or whatever. So I'm, I'm a big believer in accountability as well. Um, so moving on to uh, uh, another topic that kind of got you down to where you are is, are there a couple main points that you can point to regarding automation? So if some business owner is going, uh, what does that even mean, or, or where could I start? What are some easy places that someone could start without a long learning curve or um, a lot of expense? Oh, now you're getting me excited, Mike, because this, this, is, this is my whole wheelhouse. This is what I'm passionate about. And one of the reasons I think I'm passionate about it is because of all the pain and suffering I see out there in small business. I mean, people yeah. just work their guts out for such a tiny return on their investment. You know, I, I read a statistic. I don't know if it was with SBA or what it was, but 28 million small businesses in the United States and 22 million of them are less than 10 days away from overdrafting their business checking account. I mean, wow. things just, and the thing is, is you don't have to be a rocket science. This isn't intellect. You don't have to be super smart to succeed in business. I mean, you need to have passion, but most importantly, to answer your question, sorry to go around the weeds there, to answer your question, you have to begin with the end in mind, and then you reverse engineer a strategy to get there. And what a system is, Really, it's, it's just a simple, repeatable process that happens over and over in your business, and you need to take yourself out of that process. So let's say that you're a carpet cleaner guy, and you have a truck, and you spent $40,000 know, on your equipment, and you're starting out, and you are the HR guy. You're the op- office manager. You're the sales guy. You're the technician, right? You're everybody. You're the mechanic, right? You're changing your own brakes on your truck. The point is, is that when you, when you have a clear why, and you begin to reverse engineer a plan, the very first thing you do, no matter what line of business you're in, is zoom out. I call it getting in the hot air balloon. Zoom out, give yourself some perspective, and start identifying, what do I do every day? And then you, you list out all the things I do. I changed my breaks. I did this. I did a quote. I answered the phone. I did this. And then you start parsing that data out a little bit to figure out, you know, what can I delegate out? And how can I build a team of people around me? And then little by little, you start stepping back out of tiny little tasks, you know, and it's a huge win for a little guy just to not answer his phone. I mean, yeah, it's a gigantic thing, but you know, starting with the simplest things first, 
little by little, without having all the answers, you, you take the low-hanging fruit and you move yourself out of that. And then you move yourself out of the next thing. And then you move yourself out of the next thing. And when you're done, it creates a little box, a little machine. And hopefully that machine can produce earnings for you without you touching it very much. Yeah, and you know, you said something interesting about starting with what do you do. And I know that back um, <clears throat> probably 10, 12 years ago, I went through a coaching program, really high end with building champions. And one of or the first thing that I had to do, the first task was for the next week, write down, and I, they printed off this uh, sheet, you know, every 15 minute sections with little blanks, write down what you did the previous 15 minutes, just quick little blurbs. And, and I was like fighting them on it going, you've got to be kidding me. I'm flying them hundred miles an hour. I can't write, do it. And when you write down what you did every 15 minutes and then you go and have someone look at it with you, then you can do what you just said, which is what are some things that I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing that I could be doing differently, more efficiently? And then I would say another exercise would be um, what is your personal hourly rate? So what did you make last year? How many literal hours do you put in and what's your true hourly rate? And for some high performers or CEOs, that's a pretty healthy number. And when you then look at those those tasks that you're doing, um, you can then say, wait a minute, if I paid someone 10, 15 bucks an hour, that frees me up from doing it. And my hourly rate is 10 times that. Exactly. Absolutely. 100%. I, I'm an encourager of small businesses. And the thing is, is that they have to flip their mentality from being a technician or an artisan mm-hmm. or a self-employed person to being an executive. And yes, I'm talking to the owner operator. I'm talking to the one man show. You are the executive branch of your company. And I think the reason people don't see this stuff clearly, Mike, is because they're just numb. They're, it's like standing in the forest. You can only see the next tree in front of you. There's fires to be put out. There's a phone that needs to be answered. There's just stress. There's, there's stuff. And so the first thing you do after you really document uh, your daily behaviors is you have to create space for yourself to think. You have to force yourself to create a little bit of space to just think about your business, to think about what you're doing, to, to visualize the pieces and the moving parts. And when you get out of bed and you put out fires all day and then you go to bed exhausted and then you do it all over again, you're going to get stuck. And most businesses yep. are stuck for that very reason. You know, it, 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 you're exactly right. And I think that um, <clears throat> should you try to tackle that whole thing in one fell swoop and get it done in one day, one week, one month. No, you should, you know, chip away at it because the old adage, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So, you know, don't feel overwhelmed that, you know, I've got so much to do, feel encouraged that you do have so much to do and you can just chip away and chip away and, you know, start checking those things off and, and you start getting those kind of getting that momentum as the snowball rolls down, rolls down the hill when you start getting, you know, those kind of things accomplished and going, Hey, I can go to my kid's soccer game. You know, I mean, as an example, just yesterday, one of my daughters made National Honor Society, and the presentation was at 1 p.m. And then one of my other daughters um, had a um, championship basketball tournament at uh, 5. Well, typically, you punch the clock from 9 to 5. You're not going to make either of those things. But with my consulting practice, I schedule what I schedule. And so I made both of those things. And I know you do the same thing. And I think that more entrepreneurs need to make sure that they're taking time for their family so that they're kind of building that investment relational capital for the future. So can you speak to how um, two more F's fall into place for you, which is family and faith? Well, family is everything to me, and my faith is everything to me. I mean, the reason we moved to Costa Rica is to do ministry down here. We have a heart, you know, to share the love of God with people, you know, on a personal level. That's what I want to do. And one of my favorite statistics is that 10 out of 10 people die. (laughs) And, you know, nobody lies in their deathbed and says, man, you know, I I really wish I would have got the in-ground pool instead of the above-ground pool back in 1989. You know, that doesn't happen. You know, everyone sings the same tune. And me, being an analytical person, I look at that, and I'm like, how come nobody, when they're young, looks at what everybody that's on their deathbed says? Because they all have the same types of regrets. I wish I would have loved my family more. I wish I would have invested in my community more. I wish I would have told my kids that I loved them more. I mean, it's the same song every single time. So how can I, as a 34-year-old man and leader of my family, how can I execute on that right now? Not when I'm 72. And, you know, it it can be overwhelming for the little guy who, of course, everybody listening to this wants that lifestyle, but they don't know how to do it. 
And one of the, the good tips that I always use was to celebrate the wins along the way. You know, like you said, yeah. there's tons of stuff you can do. It's very overwhelming. And if you don't have a good network or support system, you feel like a lone ranger. But here's the deal. You know, my first Christmas party for my company, which, you know, by the time we sold it, you know, we were having full hotels rented out with conference rooms and catered dinners and cash prizes and all kinds of great stuff. The whole family would come. But the very first one was me and one guy. And I made it a big deal. You know, we, we had an award ceremony with one guy. It was totally cheesy. But the point is, is to try your best to celebrate the little victories along the way. Because when you look back at the end, you know, those are the fondest memories you have anyway. The destination usually isn't as cotton candy as you think it is. But really, it's those little victories, piece by piece, over time, that give you the satisfaction that you really want. You're exactly right, and I um, also I teach for some uh, three different universities in marketing strategy in their marketing department, and one of the really popular, uh, you know, things in the marketing world these days is um, CSR, corporate social responsibility, or cause marketing, and I think that that gets really popular because people feel like they want to, um, you know, help out um, people around the community. Well, what what better way for a Christian entrepreneur to say why don't I take and, and kind of uh, swipe and adapt, you know, and use that model because uh, your customers do appreciate when you are giving back to the community, when you are, are um, you know, giving back monetarily and of your time. But why don't you insert um, a different cause in there, and maybe it's your local uh, ministry that you're working with. Maybe it is your local church youth group that's going on a missions trip to wherever, and they're doing a fundraiser, and you can say, hey, when you come into my shop and buy my widget, X number of dollars or whatever percent is going to you know this local cause, and then that can, can accomplish a lot of things, not only to draw the community together and, and kind of build that feeling, but also to advance uh, the kingdom of God in the sense of that Boy, you know, we don't just put on our Monday through Friday hat or Monday through Saturday hat in many cases, and then Sunday, okay, yeah, okay, done. You know, God, here's my one hour for the week. See you and catch you next week. Yeah, exactly. And the CSR model is super hot right now. I mean, Tom's Shoes is a good example. They have mm -hmm. a huge company because, you know, they donate a pair of shoes for every shoe that's sold. And it's a warm, fuzzy, feel good thing. And, you know, the younger generation coming up right now, all the young, college grads who are entering the workforce, these guys, they want to be caught up in something and they want to lay down their life for something bigger than them. They're very, you know, enthusiastic about causes and life's purpose. And they're very philosophical. And, you know, from a marketing perspective, I, I just recognize that, you know, I'm not a marketing expert, but it's a very obvious trend. And, but on the local level, on the micro level in your business, I mean, you, your employees aren't just they're not, they're people. They have families, they have lives. And to yeah. me, it's an opportunity to invest in them. You can change their whole family tree. A lot of the guys that work for me never had one person in their whole life be a positive influence on them ever. I mean, it's you know, that's really interesting. I, I was at a conference about a month and a half ago. And one of the speakers we brought in was speaking about how they, he wants to be a positive impact for the kingdom of God in his local community. But he goes, what you just said, he says, I start first in my company. And he said, back in the day when I first started, if someone, and, and he ran a manufacturing, runs a manufacturing company. So he goes, if someone comes to work and they're getting ready to work on the machine and they're doing whatever, and they, you know, were dirty or grungy, or they were, you know, got in trouble with the DUI, I'd kick them to the side and say, you're fired, get out next. And he goes, but now when I can show God's love to my people, my own people, my family, my business family, um, and, and he proceeded to lay out this hour and a half long presentation of these things that would just blow your mind. But one of which is you know, using the example of like the substance abuse, he goes, we have so many people that, that would, we, we give so many second chances to, but we do one different thing. We will say to that person, do you want to change when the answer is yes, they then will go into an agreement and say the company is going to pay for a rehab. We're going to send you down to this place for whatever, a couple, three months. We're going to pay your salary while you're in rehab. We're going to pay the rehab bill. We're going to go to your family's house, and if they need meals, if they need their lawn cut or snow shoveled, we're going to take care of everything. When you come back, you've got a job waiting. And can you imagine the loyalty that that employee would have? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. It, it's so beyond powerful. People are not yep. commodities. In, in the corporate yep. world, they like to use phrases like human capital, you know, when they're describing yep. the workforce of a company. But 
it's not human capital. They're individuals with families and stories and all that. And business is business. So, you know, you got to have accountability and stuff and you can't have a total bleeding heart with everything. But when you invest in people, like what you just described, people will go to the ends of the earth for your company. I mean, they, they will follow you to war with your company because once they uh, believe that what you're doing is authentic, because everybody's a skeptic at first, once they know that this guy's for real, everything shifts. And, and, and it's not about, you know, just the daily drudgery anymore. It's about the core values of the company and the vision. And you're all in the same rowboat rowing in the same direction. You can cultivate a good company culture and have a team at um, mentality. And, you know, obviously that's great for the bottom line in the long run too. You, you're exactly right. And he's doing it for all the right reasons. And he also made the same comment you did, which was, do you think that any of my employees that, that see you know, and what I just described was like one one thousandth of what they do. You know, they have like team leaders that have discretionary money from the company that if um, uh, uh, someone's having trouble, they can just grant them money to fix whatever. And then they also have a thing where if your car breaks down in the middle of the night, you call this number and the shop comes and tows you, gets you home, takes the car to fix it, brings it back to the house, and the company pays everything. Do you think that – and he says this. Do you think that any of my employees are going to leave me for an extra 10, 15, 20 cents an hour – a dollar an hour? Nope. No. And then, nope. then he says this. He goes, um, <clears throat> I think he, I think he actually did this for real, but he he did like a mock um, demonstration for the audience, and he goes, okay, imagine you all are all um, venture capitalists, and I'm a Harvard MBA student pitching you of this business idea, and he brings up these slides, and he goes, I have a system where it will have turnover just drastic, and it has all these numbers of turnover, customer retention, employee, all of these things, and then the bottom line just going through the stratosphere up. And he goes, would you as venture capitalists want to implement this in other businesses? And, of course, everyone's like, of course, of course. And then he goes, it's the, you know, kingdom-based, caring for your company, your customers, and investing millions of dollars in that. And he goes, I've had people that call me up wanting to buy the company, and I'll turn them down, but I would say they would never be willing to accomplish what I do for the company because they would look at that as an expense or as unnecessary. But in reality, that's the thing that drives all of, all of the things they do. So, yeah, I mean, we've gone from <clears throat> automation to you know, your why, to your family, to your faith, to, you know, how to really even take care of your employee family. You know, I was watching some show last night where someone used the term uh, work husband, you know, and, and if you, you end up spending more time with your work associates than you do your, you know, own family. So if you as an employer can treat your employees that way, then that way they get home and can treat their own family, you know, with the same kind of love and respect. So any final thoughts or comments, and then uh, let let us know how we can learn more about your business and your coaching programs. Sure thing. I mean, I have one, you know, comment. Um, when you said, do you think that employee is going to leave that guy's company for another $10 an hour job or whatever? <clears throat> the phrase that comes to mind that I use in my business boot camp is decommoditizing your, your business. And so what I mean mm. by that is, you know, <clears throat> decommoditizing your product or service is a way that you can increase margins and profits. It's a way that you create your own category. Or if you sell shoes, you're so unique that really your shoes, you, you don't look at $5 shoes, $5 shoes, then yours are $45 and they're their own thing. And you can do that as an employer. And so when, from, from a little guy, a young guy who's a laborer, and he looks at jobs, the J-O-B market, and he says, okay, I can get, I can trade one hour for $12 here. I can trade one hour for Thirteen fifty here. I can trade one hour for ten here, and that's how they look at businesses mm-hmm. and, and jobs. But when you do what you just described, everything changes. You're, you're on your own shelf now. You're your own category. There's nothing people can compare it to. So they have a lot more to lose if they, you know, don't work for you anymore because they can never replace the personal investment that you've put in their life. They can't put a monetary value on the love that you have for the people in that company. And so they have nothing to compare it to. So it creates like a golden handcuffs situation, which Mm. sounds bad, but it's actually good. I mean, they don't want it. But it's all the right reasons. Yeah. And it's super profitable because you are going to have people beating your door down to work for you when word gets out and you're going to have your top, you know, you're going to be able to select the top talent in your local market. So I just think that's super awesome. And 
that guy sounds really great. And I, but this is applicable to the tiniest of businesses as well. If you have yeah. one employee, you can do the same thing. In regards to getting in touch with me, um, you, can, you can email me, josh, at automategrowcell.com. You can go to the website if you want. That's really an online uh, module-based, go-at-your-own-pace learning platform on exactly how to automate, grow and scale, and then build a business that you could sell. You know, all the architecture involved in that, step-by-step, step, it's super deep. And we have, you know, people from all over the world going through that. Um, and I also have sendgym.com, which is a software company I have. It's an iPhone app. lets you send uh, thank you postcards from your phone for, you know, busy professionals. Either of those are fine. There's contact forms on both of them. And I just appreciate you having me on. Nate, well, thank you so much. It was great to get to know you and learn from you. And thank you for your time. Take care. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.